Good evening, everyone. As you just heard, my name is Anne Marie Keating. I am currently serving as the Creighton University School of Law, American Constitution Society's chapter chief executive officer. That is a mouthful. It has been an absolute privilege to serve alongside my fellow executive board members, and I speak for all of us at Creighton ACS when I say that it is an absolute honor to be named the American Constitution Society 2023 Rising Student Chapter of the Year. Thank you. The last few years have provided a sometimes unwelcome opportunity for reflection, growth, and change. Whether it's a reflection on an individual basis, growth as an ACS chapter, or change as an entire country, we each are going to be able to look back at the last few years and know that we witnessed a profound transformation. And there is no better example of someone who has emboldened change than the man that I have the absolute pleasure of introducing today, the distinguished Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison. In In this audience, he certainly needs no introduction, and a list of his accomplishments would rival the length of the Washington Monument, but I will do my best to summarize here quickly. He began his career as an attorney specializing in civil rights and defense law, including five years as the executive director of the Legal Rights Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota. In 2002, he was elected to the Minnesota House, where he served two terms and was then elected to Congress, breaking down barriers not only as the first African-American representative from Minnesota, but also was the first Muslim to be elected to Congress. During his tenure, he fearlessly championed progressive causes, advocating for more accessible health care and improving consumer protections from predatory lending practices. However, it was during a defining moment in our nation's history that Attorney General Ellison's national prominence went to new heights. In the aftermath of the tragic murder of George Floyd, Attorney General Ellison played a pivotal role in the prosecution of Derek Chauvin, the former police officer responsible for George Floyd's death. Appointed as the lead prosecutor, Attorney General Ellison symbolized our collective desire for accountability and justice. Of course, the impact of Attorney General Ellison's efforts go far beyond a single case. In fact, he has a book coming out very soon titled Break the Wheel, Ending the Cycle of Police Violence. We are invited to examine the roles of prosecutors, defendants, heads of police unions, judges, activists, legislators, politicians, and media figures, to name a few. Each of those, Attorney General Ellison attempts to end this chain of violence and replace it, <clears throat> excuse me, replace it with empathy and shared insight. Now, if that doesn't inspire you to go out and pre-order your book, I don't know what will. My copy is coming on Tuesday, the official release date. So to put it very simply, Attorney General Ellison is not only a prosecutor or a politician, but he is an embodiment of hope, justice, and progress. Please join me in welcoming Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison. Thanks. Hey, everybody. It's great to see everyone here. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Special thanks to our president, Russ Feingold, is here for our president, everybody. Come on now. You don't get here without the right leadership. And also, uh, I just want to say uh, a shout out to Judge Lillehog. Judge Lillehog is a distinguished jurist in our state, and what a pleasure it was for me to see him here. So how you doing there, Judge? He's here for Judge Lillehog. And 
I want to say a special shout out to everyone, but uh, you know I gotta, you know I gotta give a special shout out to my Minnesotans who are here. So, you know, you know how it is. You know how it is. So I just want to dive right into the conversation because we are now almost three years away from the moment that George Floyd met his end on the corner of 38th and Chicago in the city of Minneapolis. I don't know where you were, but I'll never forget where I was, and I'll never forget how shocked, absolutely shocked I was when the tape just went on and on and on with the knee stand on the neck and his voice was loud, mama, I can't breathe. And then his words got slower, further apart till he stopped talking. But that didn't, the knee didn't stop. And yet the people who were there who did not know George Floyd began to raise their voice and say, hey, check his pulse, get off of him. And they were utterly ignored for another five minutes. And then when the EMS truck came, that's the only moment that Derek Chauvin pulled himself off of George Floyd. And when they put his body on the gurney, you could tell, anyone could tell, he was gone by then. We have not passed the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act yet. We have done a number of local reforms, but a whole lot more is needed. We are far away from where we need to be. And so I want to talk to you about how we break the cycle of police violence and why we have to do it. And one of the most important beneficiaries will be the people we ask to do policing themselves. We're asking them to do a job which is damaging to their hearts and souls on many occasions. We will benefit, they will benefit, and we can have a more just society. But let's just talk about where we are right now. I want to direct your attention to this first screen where it says, where, where we start with police settlements. We could talk about the precious life of George Floyd or Tyree Nichols or Laquan McDonald or you name it. But somehow those tragic losses of life don't impact people enough. So let's talk about what our society seems to be persuaded by money. Let's go to police settlements if this settlement, if, oh, I have, I'm the one with the clicker, y'all. Sorry about that. <laughs> they gave me the click. Usually they don't give me the clicker, so. Okay, I clicked it and it didn't click. Mind you, do it again. Oh, there it worked. Let's talk about the status quo. If you look up here at the status quo, what you will see is that Police, public records of 31 of 50 cities with the highest police to civilian ratios in the city. These are the bigger, the bigger departments. 538's analysis shows that cities have spent more than $3 billion to settle police misconduct lawsuits in the last 10 years. How are the, the potholes in your town? Seriously, how are the schools? How are the playgrounds? How's the housing? How's the health care? Three billion dollars into police misconduct, conduct that is not supposed to be happening anyway. If we solve this problem, it would have beneficial effects to our municipal budgets. And what about specific examples like New York City? In 2019, they paid out $175 million in civil judgments. Does New York have $175 million just to throw around? I don't think so. How about Chicago, 2018, $85 million to settle police misconduct cases. And in Minneapolis, since 2003, we've had over $100 million in police misconduct payouts, including $27 million to the family of George Floyd. And it's just dollars and cents until you measure what we could get with it. For fiscal responsibility reasons alone, we have got to solve this problem. What is the business case to dump $3 billion into police misconduct cases? What if we didn't have the police misconduct cases? But that's not all. Don't forget about the inevitable, foreseeable, predictable civil unrest, which will 
predictably occur after these tragic incidents. After these tragic incidents, they go on for long enough, and you're going to have people protest civil, peacefully, and then you're going to have some people get out of break some things, and you're going to, and it's going to happen. And, you, and even if nothing, even if there is no violence, you're going to have a lot of overtime and other uh, pressures on your budget. I'm telling you, the cost of civil unrest is extremely high. $500 million in damages to the Twin Cities across 20 states just because of the tragic death of, uh, involving George Floyd across 20 states. It could cost insurance companies as much as a billion to $2 billion. Loss of life. We're here talking about the occasion of George Floyd's death, but about 1,000 people a year are killed by the police annually. In 2022, in the year 2022, just last year, there were only 10 days where there was not an officer-involved shooting death. Now, I want to be clear. Not all of them were unconstitutional or illegal. Some of them may very well be within the boundaries of the law, but they still are a tragic loss of life. And let me be clear. We lose police officer lives as well. In 2020, we lost 46 officers in the line of duty. Now, it also has a deleterious effect, police misconduct does, on our civil justice and criminal justice system. As many of us, a third of wrongful convictions involve police misconduct issues. Things like what? Well, things like witness tampering, perjured, uh, perjury at trial, fabricated evidence, misconduct interrogations, concealing exculpatory evidence, Brady violations. We have to get a handle on this problem, but there's one thing that is incalculable, one thing that it's very hard to put a cost on, and that is the loss of trust that happens. And let me tell you, friends, we need to trust our police officers, and I'll tell you why. Because rape, murder, and robbery happens. It occurs. And we've got to be able to reach out to the people whose job it is to help protect our communities and trust them. This loss of trust is damaging. There have been a number of studies which have shown that after a high profile act of police brutality, 911 calls decrease. And then you have the policy of depolicing. In Minneapolis, after the tragic death of George Floyd, you had a lot of officers who said, you know what, we're going to take uh, leave, uh, disability leave. We had a 200 person reduction in the Minneapolis Police Department. And for the ones who stayed, we had many who said, I'm not engaging because I'm not looking for trouble. And people who commit crimes, and I'm a prosecutor, and there's a few of y'all in the room, they know this. What happens? We saw some massive spikes in violent crime after George Floyd. We've got to make sure we do something about this problem because we need the relationship for the purpose of public safety. Now, let me be clear. We are absolutely talking about the Constitution here. The United States Constitution, the Fourth Amendment, if it says anything at all, it says that the government cannot use arbitrary force and violence against you. The government just can't kill you and take your stuff. There's got to be a reason why sworn, warrants, things like that, oaths and affirmation. Our constitutional framework does not allow for excessive, unreasonable force against citizens. And I want to say, it's not just a bad thing that happens. It is a constitutional violation. It is a human rights violation. And we, need, and I, I, you, we can get up here and talk about voting and a whole lot of other rights, but if the government can arbitrarily, and agents of the government can just beat you down and take your stuff, kill you, then you can forget about voting. You're not alive to do it. So we have got to center the American Constitution Society must focus on this issue as a core constitutional principle. Now, moving on, I think it's important to bear in mind that the reason I call my book Break the Wheel is because we are in a very deleterious cycle. 
The first, you know, in my research for this book I just wrote, the first, the first time I found that a, a, a group of folks came together to have an investigative report, they assembled folks to have an investigative report about an incident of police brutality, was in 1919. It was after what they called the Chicago riot. And apparently there was a black kid who swam in the white water uh, at Lake Michigan. You know, in those days we thought there was black and white water. <laughs> and a black kid swam into the white area and some people started throwing rocks at him and he fell off his flotation device and he drowned. And then some people said to the police, hey, did you just see what those guys did? And the police attacked them. And that sparked what we know as the 1919 Chicago riot. After that, the University of Chicago folks assembled and did an investigative report. Well, that was just the first one that we found. A very important scholar looked at all of these re investigative reports over the course of time. His name is Dr. Kenneth Clark, and I'll mention who he is in a moment. I'm sure almost all of you already know. But when he was testifying in front of the Kerner Commission in 1968, which was a report, which was a commission pulled together, designated by President Lyndon Johnson to look at uh, the, the, this phenomenon of, of civil unrest sparked by police violence, he said, uh, Kenneth Clark said the following, I read that report of the 1919 riot in Chicago and it is as if I were reading the report of the investigating committee on the Harlem riot of 1935, the report of the investigating committee on the Harlem riot of 1943, the report of the McCone Commission and the Watts riot. And again, I in all candor say to you, members of this commission, it's a kind of Alice in Wonderland with the same moving picture re-shown over and over again, the recommendations and the same in action. Oh, and then we had the Christopher Commission after the Rodney King in Los Angeles. Oh, and then we had co commissions of after the T-neck incident. Then after Ferguson, uh, President Obama had 21st century policing. Starting to see a pattern here. And even in Minneapolis, even in Minnesota, when I became the Attorney General, I went out to a colleague of mine named John Harrington and we, he was the head of the Commissioner of Public Safety in Minnesota, and we had a working group on reducing deadly force encounters with police. And that was four, and we released our report four months before George Floyd was killed. Little did we know that after we wrote that report, it would become startlingly relevant. So American Constitutional Society, we got every reason to think about this issue and help solve it. And I don't know of another group of people who have the courage, because it's going to take a little bit of that, to press the issue both in Washington and in every state across the nation. Let me just say that no one can be above the law and no one can be beneath it. George Floyd died because some people considered him beneath the law, not worthy enough to enjoy the protection of it. And Derek Chauvin believed he was above the law. If you look at these two pictures, they're both from Minnesota. You look at the one on your left. That was the group of people assembled calling for the precious life of George Floyd to be spared. And if you look at that crowd, it is a multiracial crowd. It is not just a black crowd. There are plenty of white folks in that crowd. A hundred years before that, fateful day is another Minnesota crowd. And that was in Duluth, Minnesota, 1920. People will tell you, look at the outrageousness, the rioting. And I condemn the rioting. But they'll say, look, they burned down the third precinct in Minneapolis. Well, they burned down the third pre the precinct in Duluth, Minnesota in 1920. Did you know that? In 1920, three black men were lynched because they were falsely accused of raping a white woman in Minnesota. You thought this stuff only happened in Alabama and Mississippi? It happened in Minnesota. And you see the two men hung from a light pole, well look at the one on the ground. That is not a multicultural crowd except for the black 
you know, of the people smiling in it. This tragic incident of George Floyd caught the attention of the world. It caught the attention of the world from Buenos Aires to Brisbane to Cardiff in Wales to Cape Town, Dakar, Dublin, all over the world, people were outraged by it. You might think to yourself, well, what, why in the world would somebody from, I don't know, Cardiff, Wales care about what happened to George Floyd? And let me tell you, the answer is very simple. We have different economic and racial histories, but there's one thing everybody in the whole wide world recognizes. And what they recognize is government abuse of, of people, arbitrary government use of force, state agents abusing citizens. That is something the world knows. I don't know how many of you in this room speak Mandarin, but let me conjure an image which I bet you remember. There was once a, a, a picture of one man who was standing up against a whole row of tanks in Tiananmen Square. I see some folks nodding. Who remembers that imagery? Now, I would bet that not more than three or four of y'all speak Mandarin in this room, but that pic the import of that picture was not lost on anybody, was it? Neither was this, and that's why people in Lagos were, you know, it's an African country, most everybody there is black, but they understood what it meant. They saw the blue uniform and the knee on the neck, and therefore, it's, in that point, it, it surpasses color and culture. We've got to do something about it. Now, we did do something about it. We prosecuted Derek Chauvin, and Derek Chauvin was found guilty on all counts. I'm going to tell you this. I was in the courtroom. I led every planning session, and I did not know what was going to happen in this case until it happened, until the jury announced the verdict. I told folks, look, the history's on Derek Chauvin's side. Didn't they acquit Rodney King? Yeah. Didn't they, the jury hang in the Walter Scott case in South Carolina? Yeah. Didn't it take three or four years that Laquan McDonald's case even came to a jury trial? What, Eric Gardner has yet to see his case come to trial. History was on Derek Chauvin's side. Derek Chauvin had 18 prior complaints against him for police misconduct. It wasn't just Derek Chauvin who did the wrong thing. It was everybody who just looked the, looked the other way and didn't do anything about it who was supervising him. The people who supervised Derek Chauvin need to be held accountable too. Because if they would have been more active on their job, let me tell you what would happen with Derek, with Derek Chauvin. Derek Chauvin might not be a police officer. He might be selling insurance. He might be hanging drywall. Who knows? But he'd be free. Right now, he's doing 22 and a half years. Just like the crowd of people who call for the precious life of George Floyd to be spared, and just like the four police officers who killed him, the people who brought accountability were also a multicultural group. Let me just tell you, the four people who killed Derek, I mean, George Floyd, two white men, a black man, and a Hmong man. Does that shock you? Shouldn't. But so was our team. So was our team, people from, who's hailed from Puerto Rico, people whose ancestors were from Norway, Israel, Mexico, Africa. We had the world fighting for culp, uh, accountability for George Floyd. Now look, George Floyd was killed within a certain context. He was unemployed. He was a poor person. He got killed because he was allegedly trying to pass a bad 20. To this day, I can tell you as the lead prosecutor on that case, there is no evidence that he knew that that was a bad 20. I looked at that 20. I couldn't tell it was a bad 20. The retailers who had to hold it up to the light to say this is a bad 20, I believe them because they deal with it every day. I would, I would have been fooled. George Floyd was, house, was, was, couch, uh, was couch surfing, didn't have a stable place to live, Police brutality often is, I mean, we ask the police to maintain the structure of the society that we live in. We, won't how, we let people live in tents in the richest country in the world. We won't pay fair wages and we won't give everybody health care. And we say to the police, we're going to maintain this unfair order. 
and you use force to keep it all in place. That's what it feels like to me. Can we break the cycle of action, inaction? Yes, we can. But let me tell you this about breaking the cycle of inaction. You cannot break it unless you do two things. You must do two things. And if you don't do those two things, you can never break the cycle of inaction. You've got to prosecute criminal conduct, whether the person has a badge or not. You simply must prosecute criminal conduct. You, we have a situation of impunity, and it can't exist. And then we have to use administrative remedies to fire people and discipline them in a meaningful way when they break administrative rules. You do those two things, then you can talk about everything from training to reforming the arbitration system and all kinds of things, but you've got to get people's attention and let them know this training, it's a good idea to pay attention in the class. Right now, why would you pay attention in the class given the status quo? Your, the chances of you ever being held accountable for even the worst conduct are very remote. One of the cases that Derek Chauvin pled guilty to in the federal district court was a case where he knelt on the neck of a 14-year-old boy for 17 minutes. He ended up having to plead guilty to that in federal district court, but that case was brought to the attention of his supervisors, and they found that he did nothing wrong. But the, federal, but the federal prosecutors found that he did, and he pled to it, and he admitted to it. Let me tell you, as I wrap up, this tragic incident, three years, three years ago, May 25th, 2020, there were other tragic things that happened in our nation's past that progressive lawyers stood up and did something about and brought about meaningful change. Do you all know who Jimmy Lee Jackson is? Put your hand up if you ever heard of Jimmy Lee Jackson. If you don't know who Jimmy Lee Jackson is, I want you to ask the person at your table, who's Jimmy Lee Jackson? Because Jimmy Lee Jackson was a young man who was a, a soldier, served his nation in uniform. Jimmy Lee Jackson was protesting segregation in, in, in Marion, uh, uh, Alabama. And Jimmy Lee Jackson got attacked and an Alabama state trooper walked into a diner where he was trying to blend in with the crowd and shot him down and killed him. And as a result of that, Hosea Williams and John Lewis started marching across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And I bet y'all heard of that, right? And as a result of that action, that led to their efforts on uh, the day that you know is Bloody Sunday, March 7th, 1965, when those civil rights marchers were attacked on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. You know about that, but you may not know what the predicate was and it's what happened to Jimmy Lee Jackson. That August, Lyndon Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act. So never think that a tragic, horrible incident cannot lead to the advance of, 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 of our society if we're willing to continue to fight for it. But it won't happen if we don't. Another case, Isaac Woodard. Isaac Woodard also, a soldier, he was on a bus. And the bus driver uh, got into a dispute with him and he said, I need to get off the bus and go to the bathroom. The bus driver said something very unkind and insulting and of a racialized nature. And he said, I'm a soldier, you're not gonna talk to me that way, I put risk my life for you. And the, the bus driver didn't appreciate it none too much. And when they got to the next stop, the bus driver called the police chief. The chief came out and dragged Isaac Woodard off, the, off that bus and beat him to death and took the small end of a nightstick and jammed it into his eye sockets, blinding him. They couldn't find Isaac Woodard for two or three weeks. And when they did find him, they were happy because he was not dead. The NAACP got wind of it and Leaders in the NAACP months later had their chance to talk to uh, President Truman. And if you know the history of President Truman, you will know that he was a man of his age. You know what I mean by that? If you look at his documents, he's, he's throwing around a lot of racial, uh, uh, a lot of uh, ugly stuff. But that didn't define President Truman. He knew what was wrong when he saw it, and he said, that's wrong, and they cannot treat a man who has served in this nation's army like that. 
and he was outraged and he was appalled and he ordered the U.S. Att the Attorney General to see that the, uh, the police chief who did it was prosecuted. And that case was argued before a man named Julius Watis Waring. Anybody know who Judge Waring is? Remember that name. He is one of the unsung heroes of the civil rights movement. White man, son of Confederate soldier. <laughs> But he was a judge who was not politicized at all, but this case politicized him because he was appalled at the poor prosecution of this police officer who did this to Isaac Woodard. So outraged that he began to read and study, and he developed his legal theories to the point where he would tell Thurgood Marshall, I want you to bring a civil rights case in front of my, my courtroom. And Thurgood Marshall did. In fact, Thurgood Marshall, brought this case called Elliott versus Briggs in front of a three-judge panel of which Judge Waring was on. And he wrote a dissent in which he said segregation in public schools is per se unconstitutional. Before Brown versus Board of Education, in fact, that case was brought into the companion cases of Brown and that minority dissent that he wrote ended up being the majority opinion in Brown. You want to hear about heroic lawyers doing great things? Study this. People you wouldn't expect, but he sure stood up. And Isaac Woodard is the one who helped politicize him and get his mind moving in the direction. American Constitutional Society. A lawyer is either a social engineer or a parasite on society. You don't like that? Somebody said, no, I like that. <laughs> I'm telling you, and I mean this so sincerely, you may think, oh my God, we're three six down on the Supreme Court. Oh my God, just look, look happened to Dobbs. Oh my God, look what happened way back in 2013 uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the voting rights case. Oh my God, what happened in Epic Systems to workers trying to come together to get justice and Citizens United, and oh my God, they've just constitutionalized corruption in the McDonald case. You can go on and on and on, and people way smarter than me can do it right in this very room. But I'm telling you that Charles Hamilton Houston would tell you, buck up and get organized and start filing some motions and prosecuting some cases and defending people, and setting up some innocence projects, and doing all the things that you do. Charles Hamilton Houston would say, yeah, it looks tough, but guess what? We in this room are prepared to make that change. The legal system he was facing is tougher than the one you are facing. Am I right about that, Mr. President? Things were tougher for Charles Hamilton Houston than you. The question is, do you believe we can turn this thing around? And who do you expect to do it if it's not you? I, I'm betting on you. I believe in you. So my friends, leaders are people who will choose an uncertain but possibly better future than a certain but terrible status quo. Who's ready to be a leader? Thank you very much. Please welcome to the stage ACS President Russ Feingold. Thank you, Attorney General Ellison. What a powerful way to conclude our convention program. You're a great Attorney General, you're a great and consistent friend of ACS, and you're a great friend of mine. So thank you so much for helping us out with that. And thanks to all the speakers and panelists in the last couple of days. I want to thank all of you for coming to this convention. I can tell you I noticed a difference between last year and this year. I didn't get to come to a convention in the previous two years. And in fact, what I noticed last year was everybody was really relieved and happy to be able to see each other. 
And people I thought were a little edgy about the pandemic and a few other things. We had a great convention. But what I saw in the last two days, what I heard in the halls as well as in the programs, people somehow combined a sense of lightheartedness with a seriousness of purpose and maybe even some new confidence. That's what I have observed from all of you in the last two days, and I thank you for it. It means so much as we go forward. We have to help each other have the feeling that we really can accomplish these things. And you've got to let this feeling from these two days continue uh, throughout the year until you can come back together again. So I urge all of you to remain engaged in this effort. Go to our website at acslaw.org to find out more about your local student and lawyer chapters and how you can support our work. Our network, you here and all over the country, as I've observed, is the heart and soul of the American Constitution Society. Finally, of course, I want to thank our incredible board of directors, our sponsors, and our staff, whose tremendous work brought us all together this week. And I would also encourage all of you to join us for our Members of Color Mixer, which was going to begin at 6.15. We're pretty close. Uh, it's beginning in the South American room. Thank you all for joining us. I look forward to working with all of you.